Revelation 6, 26 through 22. Fulfilled or not fulfilled? That is the question. Last week, we read through John's vision of the throne room with verse 1 saying that a door in heaven was opened and for him to physically enter into. The fact that he was going into the throne room of God would have immediately reminded the readers of prior prophets in the Old Testament of their experience going into God's heavenly court. Daniel 7 is by far the most relevant to our Revelation study as it's not just alluded to in uh, chapters 4 and 5, but is peppered in throughout the entirety of the book. And the most important linking descriptor between Revelation and Daniel 7 is the Son of Man coming on clouds language that we know is Jesus. In Mark 14, we read that when Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, the divine figure in Daniel 7, is that that answer is ultimately what condemned him before the Sanhedrin. But we also saw that Jesus was explaining in Matthew 13 that at the end of the age, that he, as the Son of Man, will send out his angels to gather all evildoers from the world for final judgment. So I hope you can see how important Daniel 7 is in any time or any end times discussion. Now, originally, I had part two in mind of this chapter four and five study where I would have led us through uh, kind of in a similar fashion as we did in our John's vision of Christ in chapter one by taking a look at its Old Testament backdrop and that all the divine attributes were being directly applied to Jesus, like calling him that he had hair and head like white wool and snow. That is straight out of Daniel 7, 9, where in there it was applied to the ancient of days, who without question is God. And from that alone, you can tell that John is thinking that Jesus, or he knows that Jesus is God, because you just would not do that if you didn't think otherwise. And as we continued seeing those Old Testament connections throughout that study, is that some of you did pick up on that the descriptors in chapter 1 were used in the seven letters to the churches. That was intentional and really very intelligent, because if you take a church like Smyrna, who Jesus said was going to have the devil throw them into prison and that some of them were probably going to die, is that they were charged to be faithful unto death. Is that Jesus' self-description at the opening of that letter was directly related to his message to that church. With, in this case, he was telling them, hey, look, you're going to die, but look at me. I died, but now I'm alive again. So don't fear death. And Jesus' other self-descriptions in the rest of the letters work that way as well. So if you're ever going to go through a, a seven uh, letters study again, is that try to keep those in mind as it helps illuminate what Jesus was uh, getting after, especially with each one of those churches. Now, recognizing that John's descriptors of Jesus flowed into ch chapter uh, two and three, seven letters, is that John's throne room descriptions do the same largely into the judgment scenes of chapters 6 through 19, but also into the final three chapters with the ushering in of God's everlasting kingdom. But it doesn't mean that we won't see themes from chapters 1 through 3 not showing up in the remaining chapters. The easiest example is the Book of Life that we saw in 3.8 as it shows up five more times throughout the book. In chapters 4 and 5, John's use of the Old Testament is extremely evident, and I would say, again, extremely intentional, because there's many descriptors that, you know, we have probably seen see the artists go a little overboard, uh, like we did in chapter 1, with Jesus being shown completely white, brass feet, but uh, literally a sword sticking out of his mouth. Uh, that is from Isaiah 49.1. And, you know, just thinking about what is a sword in really referring to? His word, right. His word is that powerful. His word created all creation. His word can overpower anything. This is the same with Jesus being described as having seven horns and seven eyes in 5-6. He 
He doesn't have seven horns uh, up in heaven. He never had horns, obviously, on earth. It's a, it's a mark of rulership. And, you know, throughout Revelation, you always see what number showing up over and over and over again. Seven. And, you know, the thing you don't see in the Bible is the word percent. And what seven signified to them is completeness. And so if you have seven horns or seven amounts of authority, it's you have complete authority. And then with the eyes, uh, again, that is, you know, he doesn't have seven eyes up there. He has two, just like the rest of us, is that the seven eyes description is pulling from Zechariah 3, 4. And there it's describing God's all-knowing omniscience because he knows everything that's going on in all the affairs of the world, which in the context of the throne room scene is, uh, makes a lot of sense because then what? Jesus is worthy to judge because he knows all and sees all. And if you go back and check the other Old Testament cross-references, is that those embedding into chapters 4 and 5 do the same. And with that frame of mind is that when we see these descriptors start appearing uh, throughout the remaining chapters, is that a few more bells will go off in your head as to what is being uh, getting after here. It's really a beautifully woven together, uh, weaving together of the Old Testament and John's actual vision of heaven. So that is just a small snippet of what part two would have looked like uh, had I gone that complete route, but kind of got nudged into a different direction uh, with today's main topic question that sometimes does become quite heated uh, as in a debate within the church as a whole. We know that the book is prophetic in nature. It says that at the beginning, it says it at the end, which naturally then stirs up the conversation of, is it fulfilled or not? And the approach that we are gonna take is that we're gonna track actually on the book of life. But if you were to look into this topic is that most of the uh, debates would start and center around the composition of the book. When did John actually write it down? If Revelation was written towards the end of the first century, around 96 AD, which is what our most conservative scholarship uh, lands on, is that the total fulfillment view, uh, which is called full preterism, falls apart because 70 AD is long past and prophecy looks forward. It's not a hindsight that John is doing here, and it would just be totally dismissed. But there are other oaths that contend that the book was written before 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem, and that at that point, then the book is open to saying that all of it was fulfilled there. Uh, there are views that are, you know, hey, there were some there, but then it extended on. Uh, but we're looking at total fulfillment or not. So without getting into that back and forth debate about when it was written, is that we are going to use the book of life to help guide us uh, because it's going to give us a breadcrumb trail that ultimately brings us to the final answer to this eschatological quest. What you might not have realized before in your general reading is actually how often the book of life shows up within the Bible. Paul refers to it actually in Philippians 4.3, saying that Clement and other co-workers of his are written down in the book of life. Jesus also said to the 70 when he sent them out and they came back is that their names are written in heaven. Same thing in Luke 10. And that that should be the rejoicing point, not, hey, look, we have, you know, power over demons. We can tell them what to do and get out and all that. He's saying, no, that's your rejoicing point is up there. I would also say that Jesus comments when he says that he's going to confess um, people before God and angels in heaven is that this is what he was talking about as well. But then in the Old Testament is that we see it first appear in Exodus 32. Moses here is pleading to God to not, or actually to blot him out instead of Israel. And does anybody remember why in Exodus 32? Want to take a stop, stab in the dark or whatever? Yes, they did do that because it comes right after the golden calf scene. And Moses knows that God has a rightful uh, possibility here to blot Israel completely out for turning towards idolatry so quickly after the Exodus is concluded. 
So Moses begs God to punish him instead of the whole nation. And, you know, that's kind of like a foreshadowing of Christ in that. What's interesting is that we see David again at, uh, saying to blot out uh, his enemies in Psalm 69, 28, uh, and because basically they're coming after him and, you know, internally as, as well, not just the pagans outside. And most recently, like we talked about, is that we saw it in 3.8 with Jesus saying to the Sardis church that he won't blot them out, but will confess them before God, the Father, and angels, just like we saw him saying in Matthew and Luke. But the most important example for us to track on is in Daniel 12. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So right there is our reference to the book of life. And he goes on saying, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So what is being discussed here in verse 2? Heaven and hell, the judgment scene. But those that are falling asleep, they're going to do what? They're going to wake up, which is an allusion to? Resurrection. So he's speaking about what we would say the gen of the general resurrection, which is, occurs at the eschaton, the, out, the last days. But what do you also see in there? It's the final judgment scene that you're referring to where people are either going to heaven or they're going to hell. Verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I was thinking back to last week. Why does this sound so familiar? Because Jesus said and described believers at in that way in the parable of the weeds but in the scope of revelation is that we see this uh, in chapter 20 and i saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and i saw the dead small and great stand before god and the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. All of this is connected to Daniel 12.2. There's no distinguishing these two scenes from one another. And where we're tracking with this is that Paul spoke about this as well in First. Corinthians 15, where he talked thoroughly about the vital importance of resurrection to our faith. Without a resurrection, our faith is worthless. It's, it's really a joke. Verse 23, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then when Christ comes, those who belong to him. Then, Christ, then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he has brought to an end all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he put, has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be eliminated is death. These four verses provide us with a simple outline of how the, the last days are going to work. And that Christ's coming is directly tied to the very end, the eschaton. And at that point, the last thing to be eliminated is what? Death. Death will no longer exist. Now, on kind of the, the Greek side, the tracking point for us is that one of the big three words that Paul uses with Jesus' return first appears in verse 23, and that's Christ's parousia. At the end of 1 Corinthians, and in 2 Corinthians 7 and 10, Paul used this word with people like Titus and others uh, in their showing up, and that Paul described his bodily presence as weak, and basically like, hey, you know, he wasn't that impressive of a man, uh, just on looks alone. So if you're comparing these examples with the one 
that we saw in uh, 1523 is that what do you think Paul imagined with Christ's return? That his return would be in what form? Physical and, and visible. Now, I'm pretty confident that everyone in here is like, yep, we get that. We're, we're all on the same page here. Um, but just keep sticking with me on this. So, other than Corinthians, Paul spoke about Christ's return with another church quite extensively, and that was the church at Thessalonica. Using again parousia in his first letter is that you can see in verse 13 that he says as he comes down, angels are also coming with him. Now in his second letter to the Thessalonians is that in chapter 2 it gets pretty juicy when it comes to the end times discussion. Because verse 8 talks about Jesus coming that will involve him destroying the wicked, or in many versions we'll say the lawless one, who is probably better known as close Not the, antichrist. the antichrist. antichrist yep verse 9 informs us that this individual's parousia the antichrist is supported by satan and that satan is going to be empowering him with all powers signs and lying wonders uh, that satan has at his disposal now we're going to unpack this a little bit more uh, because in verse 2 jesus or he calls jesus second coming paul that is the day of Christ, which is in the KGB. Most modern versions will say, though, the day of the Lord, something you probably see a lot in the Old Testament. But it doesn't matter because it's really, it's the same thing because Paul elsewhere said the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking about the same thing. It's interchangeable. Paul continues to say to the Thessalonians that, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away, apostasia, apostasy, first. And that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the sequence here <clears throat> is that a great apostasy is going to take place in those who say they follow God. And then the Antichrist, in probably close conjunction to that, is going to be revealed to the world. And But eventually that's going to not be allowed to continue on, and Christ will come back to destroy him. Paul continues to say about this lawless one that he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as to be God sitting in the temple of God proclaiming himself that he is God. So you can see how far this guy is willing to go. But this figures revealing which is our second big word here is apocalyptico that is connected ex with his parousia. So they're speaking of the same thing. A Rudolph word of this is apocalypsis, which, you know, the very first verse in Revelation 1, is used by Paul for Jesus' second coming. 2 Thessalonians 1 7 says that Jesus' revealing from heaven will occur again with angels coming with him. Peter 2 spoke about Jesus' visible return as well. Paul included. In there, our third significant word in 2 Thessalonians 2.8, and that is his epiphania, which probably in the English, you probably hear what word? Epiphany. The significance with that word is that Paul used it in 2 Timothy 1.10, where he was referring to Jesus' incarnation, which obviously was done in physical, visible form. So, Paul continued to use this word in his pastoral epistles many times to Jesus' second coming. So if, Jesus, if Paul used it with his first coming in physical and visible form, then Paul meant that his second coming will be in the same manner. So all three clearly describe a visible return of Christ from heaven with an angelic host and army taking, coming down to take on the Antichrist and his followers, which you'll see as we get into chapter 13 and all the way through 19. This is without question the scene that I just said in chapter 19, starting in verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and here came a white horse. The one riding it was called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and goes to war. The armies that are in heaven, dressed in white, clean, fine linen, were following him on white horses. 
Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to do battle with one who rode the horse and with his armies. So with all those connecting together between Daniel, Paul, and John in Revelation, is that this deals a death blow to the whole idea that everything has been fulfilled in 70 AD. Now, the Antichrist and Christ coming, obviously at that point, did not happen, and nor did the general resurrection take place. And, you know, if you obviously check the news, people are still dying today. Now, there's another view out there that says, well, the whole book is nothing but uh, symbols. And it's all just symbology, and it's trying to teach us truths in life and so forth. Now, okay, are there symbols in the book? Yeah, yes. Here's what I'll question. Does he usually describe what those symbols mean in the book? Yes, yes. <laughs> we also see that. It's always talking about something real and tangible. But was Christ's resurrection symbolic? No, obviously not. And is ours going to be symbolic? No. That's taking the text way too far. Now, I understand that, you know, somebody on this side of the aisle, the full preterist, would probably say, well, Josephus's comments uh, had numerous strange phenomena going on during the Roman siege, uh, starting 66 through 70. The most intriguing of those is that he says that people observed chariots and troops of soldiers and armor running around in the clouds, and they were surrounding the cities. And then they would probably back it up by saying that, you know, hey, Roman historian Tacitus, uh, who also wrote, uh, said that various portents had occurred at this time. Now, Tacitus is most likely just pulling from Josephus, plug it in in his work and just saying, okay, this is what they saw. He's not saying, hey, the Roman soldiers saw this too and came back and like they saw crazy signs up there. That's not what he's saying. So it's not like, oh, we got these two independent uh, agreements going on. But even if you tried to stick with that, is that we know that the general resurrection has not taken place and death has not been eliminated. It just doesn't hold up. Plus, if you're saying that in 70 AD that, you know, this is when it all got done is, okay, who is the man of sin then? Titus, Emperor Vespasian. Well, that gets really weird because they never died. They lived on, they beat, the Jews, they obviously won. So in a weird way, now you got what? If Jesus really came down, he's now on their side? Obviously, this is, just see how it just starts to crumble. Jesus didn't visibly destroy them with an angelic army. And so it just doesn't work biblically. And a simple question was um, to them is that if that was the case, then why isn't none of that taking place? Or why did nobody in the early church report about that? There's nobody that said, yep, it was all done then. But some of them might try to punt it to Constantine and just say, oh no, the church you know, eventually conquered the Roman Empire. And it's just like, ah, just, just stop right there, please. Because <laughs> that fails because the, at the Council of Nicaea, which is most often you know, tagged with Constantine, uh, allowing Christianity in, is that they developed the Nicene Creed, which I'm sure probably many of us have read many times over, um, which included the statement that they were still expecting Jesus to return in the future. And even in 30, uh, 381 at the Council of Constantinople is that they extended onto this creed by saying whose kingdom is going to last forever. And they finished updating their saying by saying we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So this, as a church, has been professed for over 1,700 years now. It's still out there. And this should sound kind of familiar because of Jesus' response to the Sadducees in Luke when he was discussing, or really they were trying to trip him up, on marriage and resurrection. So Jesus said to them, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are regarded as worthy to share in that age and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. In fact, 
they can no longer die because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, since they are sons of the resurrection. This concept of the present age and the age to come, and obviously we see it's clear to scriptures here, there's going to be a change in how things work, is that Jesus speaks about it elsewhere throughout the Gospels as well. And Jesus' coming and resurrection are connected with the final chapters of Revelation, which again still is to be in the future. The natural next question that I think probably most, uh, probably in this body or others that you know have always held this view is, are we living in the last days, the end end of it? The easy answer to the first part of that is yes, because Hebrews 1, 2 and uh, Acts 2, 17 inform us that since Pentecost, it has been the last days. And even though that has this has continued on for basically 2,000 years now, is that that designation is still in place. Paul even calls this period uh, an evil age. It's not one that's really progressing towards, you know, full goodness everywhere. And so does, uh, he knows this because that the spiritual enemies of God haven't been dealt a, a, away with at this point. And he even says that Satan is called the what? God of this world. And Jesus even said that as well in John. But like I said, most probably wonder, are we at the end end, and which is, you know, okay, now how, how close are we hugging that line? Are we there or are we here? Uh, who knows? So I'll just kind of leave it with here with a little added piece of not to scale, which I know, yeah, Matt and I talked about it. It's like, yeah, just leave it there. There we go. Not, not to scale. That's the best way to have a chart. <laughs> Regardless is that when uh, all this does go down is that we know really what the end game is and that ultimately Christ will be ruling on earth. And I do look forward to that day and I get to see him face to face. And the biggest part of that is Revelation 21.8 where his promise is, is that no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. It's just life everlasting with him. The original Edenic vision is completely restored. And that, ooh, did it go away? Oh, it didn't even appear. Well, that's all right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I know it's probably a, a topic like, okay, we got that and so forth, um, and probably one that we probably held, maybe... Anybody used to be from the other side of the aisle by chance? No? Okay. But there are some. And uh, a point to be probably made within all that is, you know, some that know it all done there and we see, you know, earth is progressing and so forth is, uh, you know, you read in the church letters that Jesus warns them a lot, right? Is that when pressure comes is that it's easy to then what? Get disheartened. Um, and especially starting to get, what, maybe mad at him and possibly then rebel and, like he said, apostatize away. And so although eschatology in and of itself is not a salvation issue, uh, it doesn't make, you, make or break you, uh, it's your faith, um, but it can influence your faith and your way of thinking and what you expect. And so... It does serve uh, an important need. Uh, there's a reason why it's at the end of the book. It's not just because it's the last thing, but it's still a very, very important thing uh, to be discussed. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to visit us at justscripture.org. And in the meantime, stay salty.